Okay, let's get, it, get started. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome again to the second day of the uh, MIT inaugural symposium in statistics. Let me just make a few comments about today. We have a few talks in the morning and then lunch, and then after lunch we have a discussion period. Uh, the, in the discussion, we, our speakers will be our panelists. We'll they'll all be sitting in the, uh, sit, seated in the, in the front. We have some questions that we would like them to address that uh, we have actually sent to them already. If they check their emails, if they haven't, well, we'll ask them again. Um, but then also we'll open it up for uh, discussion with the audience. So you, you're welcome to stick around and, and uh, raise the questions that you need. I'm carrying my cup of coffee over here, but it's, we're not supposed to be bringing coffee to the room. Um, so uh, just in the spirit of uh, transparency and openness, that's my coffee as well. So I just, uh, <laughs> but please, please don't spill anywhere on the floor. I think that's, <laughs> anyway. So um, my colleague, uh, Stephanie uh, Jigelka, will be presenting the speaker today. So. Welcome. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Roger Conker, from the University of Illinois. Roger is a, a William B. McKinley Professor of Economics and Statistics, and his research interests include quantile regression, in particular the estimation of conditional quantile functions, non-parametric density estimation, and empirical base. Thank you. So thanks very much. Uh, it's a great uh, privilege to uh, be here on, and uh, be able to participate in this auspicious beginning of uh, statistics at MIT. It seems a little bit amazing that uh, it's really the beginning of statistics at uh, MIT, but uh, it's uh, better late than never, right? Uh, so my frivolous title probably looks a little bit absurd, especially from a Bayesian perspective. Um, but it somehow um, encompasses both uh, the things that I want to say a little bit about uh, today. Uh, I'll say a little bit about quantile regression, which was an obsession of mine for a long time. Um, and then I'd like to say a little bit about uh, some recent work on empirical Bayes. Um, so um, to establish a um, firmly non-technical uh, beginning to the talk, um, I'm going to uh, uh, begin with a fragment of a poem by W.H. Uh, Auden. Um, <laughs> and uh, this was uh, a poem that he wrote in 1946 um, for some kind of Phi Beta Kappa ceremony at the other uh, institution of higher learning in Cambridge. Um, <laughs> So it begins this way, um, and I think it's kind of unexceptionable, um, you know, the first stanza. Um, uh, so this is really a, a fragment that uh, has a long introduction, but this is like Ten Commandments of Academic Life for uh, uh, prospective academics, I suppose. Um, but um, second stanza is kind of... Uh, a little bit uh, more dangerous. Um, but I'm going to try to do something now that uh, if, I can, if I can manage to do this. Um, but where's the mouse? Uh, I may need help with this. No, uh, OK. I'm going to try to give you the voice of the poet himself, if I can. Oh, come on. There we go. Thou shalt not do as the dean pleases. Thou shalt not write thy doctor's thesis on education. Thou shalt not worship projects, nor shall thou or thine bow down before administration. Thou shalt not answer questionnaires or quizzes upon world affairs, nor with compliance take any test. Thou shalt not sit with statisticians, nor commit a social science. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know, it's not just the mathematicians who are uh, after us, you know, it's, uh, um, yeah, I mean, a poet's job, I suppose, is to uh, kind of try to um, 
say something about the uh, unique, and um, statisticians are supposed to try to ignore a bit of that and uh, say something about uh, the collect some greater collective truth. Um, but I want to argue that uh, there are some opportunities to try to push um, statistics in the direction of a little bit more um, careful look at the heterogeneity in uh, <clears throat> a variety of contexts. Um, so I have the impression that MIT somehow uh, has maybe paid too much attention to this uh, <laughs> Uh, proclamation of uh, Auden, um, and um, I, I kind of, I, I mean, I view this, uh, and I think we all do, as uh, quite unfortunate. Um, statistics really is a common language for the evaluation of scientific evidence, and um, if institutions neglect this, then it's a recipe for um, a kind of fragmented discourse in which statistics is reinvented in one field after another. I've seen this in my own university, and I think it, it's occurred quite a lot um, in, in other places. But the fragmentation is really very dangerous uh, because it gives each discipline some kind of uh, license to invent a statistics for themselves, which uh, can actually be brought together by a uh, core statistics faculty and an institution in a way that uh, really benefits students and faculty alike. Um, so early in my career, I uh, spent a long time uh, uh, sitting with statisticians. Um, I was at Bell Labs for seven years uh, uh, in a econo small economics group, but it was in the math center, and it was very, it was just uh, across the hall from uh, the statisticians uh, led by John Tukey and Colin Mallows, <clears throat> John Chambers. And I, desert, I you know, derived enormous benefit from that. And I've continued to sit with statisticians <laughs> for uh, the rest of my career and uh, der derived uh, enormous benefit from that. Um, so uh, it seems with every almost every major university expanding in statistics, it's uh, about time that um, this happened at MIT, uh, Auden notwithstanding. Um, so, um, see if I can get, move the cursor off the. Uh, <laughs> okay. Now, can I? Oh, shoot. So, um, very brief uh, kind of historical transition. Um, so in some way, uh, Catelet is my uh, hero and uh, also villain in, in uh, some respects, uh, just because um, he uh, had this kind of relentless uh, search for uh, new data in the social sciences and tried to make something out of measurement in the social sciences. Um, but he, he really... Uh, uh, did to a kind of fault, I would say, emphasize uh, the idea that there was an like, average man, that uh, somehow everything was revealed by uh, average behavior and um, average uh, <clears throat> uh, physical uh, uh, circumstance and so on. Um, and Galton, to some degree, uh, reinforced this with the invention of regression. But I, I think I'll say, um, few things about Galton in a moment. Um, um, but I also wanted to mention Florence Nightingale just because um, uh, she has a kind of underrepresented uh, appreciation, I think, in, uh, in statistics. Um, and in particular, <clears throat> uh, she, uh, there's a letter um, to Francis Galton that appears in a, uh, in the biography of, that Carl Pearson wrote of Galton, uh, in which she advocates a uh, position, uh, I mean, a professorship in statistics at Oxford. Uh, and I, I really believe that this, this document, this letter, is one of the most uh, compelling uh, rationales for statistics in the social sciences that uh, we have to date. 
Um, I actually recommend it as a uh, document for the, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, for the people uh, building the statistics uh, group here. Um, and it, uh, but it, but Galton seemed to feel that it wasn't um, entirely clear that a, uh, full, a professorship was what was needed. He had, uh, he had the idea that junior faculty had a lot more energy, and uh, maybe that was a better strategy for uh, developing the department. But in any case, uh, nothing much happened at Oxford uh, in statistics until the 1960s, as far as I can tell. They did hire. Uh, Francis Edgeworth around the same time that this letter was written, but he seemed to have, at that point, uh, become professor of political economy and thought he should do economics rather than uh, statistics. And um, so uh, his earlier work in statistics uh, um, didn't really foretell uh, much additional uh, work after <clears throat> 1891 or so. Um, so it's about the variability. Um, so there's a, a sense in which uh, you know Galton kind of is responsible via regression for uh, giving us this kind of uh, single-minded focus towards uh, linear regression and uh, estimating conditional mean functions. But I wanted to kind of at least mention that uh, before he uh, invented regression, he was quite a non-parametric kind of guy. And um, this is quite in line with the first few comments that I want to make a little bit about quantile regression, um, which is an idea that really just takes off from the kind of simple Tukey idea that it's useful to summarize um, uh, sing univariate distributions with a few quantiles. Um, and um, it's, and quantile regression is just a very simple way to, to uh, think about uh, trying to do that <clears throat> in a more structured, uh, more uh, uh, linear model kind of uh, way. Um, I don't, uh, I guess I don't need to really say too much more about that. Um, I, um, I did want to I've written a, <clears throat> I, I once wrote a paper about 10 years ago or so called The Median is the Message, and I wanted to um, sort of underscore um, the fact that um, somehow um, one really shouldn't be satisfied. If one isn't satisfied with means, one shouldn't be satisfied with medians either. I think most of you probably know the story of Stephen Gould, who prominent American paleontologist at, at Harvard and uh, was diagnosed with uh, an abdominal cancer at age 40 and was told by his oncologist that the median, uh, his median lifetime was eight months at that point. And he proceeded to leave, live for another 20 years. Um, and uh, he wrote quite a nice statistical memoir uh, with this title, The Median is Not the Message. Um, and it, I highly recommend it, actually. Um, but uh, I guess from, from my current point of view, the, the, the point is just that um, I th it's, I think, quite useful in a lot of regression circumstances to look at um, um, a family of conditional quantile models. Um, they're quite easy to estimate, uh, at least in linear in parameters formed uh, by linear programming methods. There's quite a well-developed literature on inference and, uh, and non-parametric methods in this uh, context. There's quite interesting work on uh, sensor data and survival models and uh, kind of growing literature on, on longitudinal data. Uh, and there are a lot of interesting new questions that could be um, uh, addressed. Um, I think among those, causal modeling is, is very high on the list. Um, high dimensional uh, uh, settings are obviously Im extremely important these days. And there's also quite an interesting um, <clears throat> new literature on extensions to uh, multivariate response. So this is... Um, a kind of example, I guess, of a um, um, fairly recent uh, non-parametric quantile regression exercise that 
I've been involved in with some <clears throat> biologists in Quebec. Um, it's really all about uh, fish metabolism and feeding and um, fish farming and this sort of thing. But uh, the thing that I like about it is that it's strongly motivated by uh, scientific questions about what the real features of the um, data that are of interest might be. And here, the, the main thing is uh, trying to estimate this minimal level of uh, uh, metabolic activity that the fish uh, is um, undergoing. <clears throat> so the curve is actually estimating the uh, 15th percentile of the, uh, in, this, in this model, the, there, this is a kind of uh, quite simple um, total variation smoothing spline kind of um, estimation procedure. Um, so it's really quite a lot like the classical WABA um, smoothing spline, except that the fidelity is not least squares. It's uh, this quantile regression uh, objective function. And the penalty, instead of being L2 um, WABA penalty, is, the, uh, is, is just an L1 version of that, which is, uh, corresponds to the total variation of the first derivative. Um, so this is a, um, uh, an example of a case where I think um, the, the science really dictates that uh, the lower quantiles are the thing that is of primary interest. And, um, we can try to um, provide something that uh, answers that question. More, much more challenging kind of problem for, quant for quantile regression uh, applications is the um, uh, <coughs> attempt to estimate uh, contours for multivariate response. Um, this is a figure taken from a paper by uh, Ying Wei, who's um, in at Columbia and Biostat. Um, we'd worked earlier on, together on uh, univariate uh, growth charts for, for children. And she was interested in trying to extend this to both height and weight uh, uh, data. <clears throat> and so what you see in both figures, the dashed lines are an unconditional version of uh, quantile contours for, uh, the, for two-year-olds. Um, based on a reference data set. And then um, with an additional covariate involving the parent's height, um, which I presume, I, but I don't really remember, I, I think is the Galton parent's uh, average height. Um, we have on the, on the uh, left side uh, red contours indicating uh, a relatively short uh, parents, and on the right, relatively tall parents, and one sees this E as a um, particular patient who would have looked quite unusual from the point of view of the unconditional quant contours, but uh, looks relatively normal in the um, uh, context of the uh, upper, con uh, the red quant contours. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, um, with that, let me make kind of a, <clears throat> an abrupt transition to um, my obligatory big data slide. Um, so <laughs> I have only one big data slide. Um, and this is a bit strange as a big data slide in the sense that um, it's just a density estimation problem. I mean, it's a univariate density estimation problem. But it is based on a very large data set. Um, so, Fateh Guven and, and uh, some colleagues at Minnesota have been working with a 10% sample of the uh, <clears throat> US Social Security records that are linked to um, W2. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, um, I need water. Um, linked to uh, IRS records. And so they have um, very large samples of annual income data for um, US households. So they've estimated um, densities for annual, so they take logarithms of annual income and they fit a model that takes out the uh, age effect of the um, uh, uh, 
life cycle effect. And then they um, um, estimated a density uh, for annual increments for, for log income. And then you, if they, when they plot log uh, density on the left side, um, <clears throat> they get this thing that looks a bit like a Laplace distribution if you didn't look at the vertical scaling. Um, and clearly you have something quite non-normal. I mean, you would expect to see something uh, quite quadratic there and uh, you're seeing something not very quadratic at all. And in fact, even uh, the Laplace distribution doesn't do a very good job. You'd see something quite V-shaped and uh, nicely uh, concave. Um, so neither of these uh, log concave models are actually fitting the data very well. But it turns out that um, if you sort of are willing to impose a little bit weaker concavity restriction, so instead of saying that the, the density is log concave, you say that it's... Uh, that, one, that minus one over the square root of the density is concave, you get this nice, almost quadratic looking uh, figure in the center, and you can easily fit that by maximum likelihood using the shape constraint uh, that, the, that one over root density is uh, concave. But the thing that's really striking about the whole exercise to me is that you see here that almost all of the density is um, supported on, say, minus one to one. Um, and all of the kind of interesting kind of tail behavior that one gets to see from the very large sample that um, they have at their disposal is um, giving information about uh, really quite uh, dramatically um, unusual observations. Um, but I think we we really haven't seen, um, in economics at least, or appreciated the uh, degree to which uh, this sort of inequality or this sort of tail behavior is, uh, is present in, the, uh, in, in income data. So that was a kind of transition um, <laughs> to um, a kind of... Uh, new venture f um, for me that um, occurred more or less because I was doing this uh, work on, on uh, shape constraint density estimation. I happened to be giving a talk at Wharton <clears throat> and Larry Brown asked me about uh, um, a quite classical um, <clears throat> empirical Bayes problem. Uh, he and Eitan Greenstein had, had written a paper um, looking at uh, this kind of standard Gaussian sequence model and saying, well, let's see whether we can estimate the, uh, this uh, uh, Bayes rule, this so-called Tweedy formula. Um, and um, the natural thing to do, um, I guess, I mean, the, the obvious thing to do Given the, the formula, uh, then the fact that, we, don't, that we, we really don't need to know the mixing distribution, F, um, would be to uh, estimate the, uh, estimate G, the marginal distribution of the observed Ys by uh, some kind of kernel method, and then uh, plug that into the, uh, to the Bayes rule. But Larry was rather dissatisfied with that in the sense that uh, the standard exponential family uh, theory tells you that the Bayes rule should be uh, monotone. Um, and so he thought, well, maybe if we can estimate densities that are imposing a shape constraint like log concavity or like this uh, a bit stranger, uh, weaker notion of concavity in the previous uh, slide, that uh, one could use maximum likelihood here as an alternative. <clears throat> and so this seemed like an interesting homework problem, and it turned out that it was relatively easy to solve. All one needs to do is uh, impose a convexity constraint that looks like a half, I mean, so that you just integrate this, uh, the Bayes rule up and, and call that a convexity constraint and, and the maximum likelihood estimator is still uh, nicely regularized by it. 
the density estimates that you get look a little bit strange, but uh, nonetheless, they actually work, work surprisingly well in uh, standard forecasting uh, settings. Um, so what I mean by standard or st standard, I guess, simulation settings is what I meant to say. Um, for example, the, the ones in uh, this uh, famous Needles and Haystack paper of Johnstone and Silverman or more recent uh, paper by Castillo and Van der Vaart. Um, so there, there seem to be, um, it, well, there, there are probably many, many approaches to um, estimating the, uh, this, uh, uh, sorry, the, this Bayes rule. Oh, I was going to say, I, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, this is Brad Efron's uh, terminology. Uh, I think he's responsible for uh, calling this Tweedy's formula. And uh, this is based on an attribution of uh, Herbert Robbins in his 56 paper, um, giving credit to um, uh, an English statistician, MCK Tweedy. Um, but I, um, I learned only recently, but I, I thought since Steve was here, I should mention uh, in connection with uh, his infamous uh, law of eponymy that uh, I discovered that uh, this actually, the, the formula actually appears in a uh, physics paper in, the, in 1926 credited to Arthur Eddington. Uh, so it's, you know, one more example if, if this isn't already on your roster of examples. Um, so anyway, there, there are many possible ways to go about uh, estimating this Bayes rule. <clears throat> Um, the, uh, <clears throat> but one way uh, seemed to be this uh, shape constrained strategy that uh, um, we had used earlier, and that seemed to actually perform quite well. So then I started looking around, thinking, well, I should compare this with whatever else is around in the literature. And although, I mean, I was happy that it performed a little bit better than the, the Brown and Greenstein. Uh, 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 kernel method, and it maybe isn't that surprising since it imposes a little bit more structure. But in reading uh, this uh, paper by Zhang and Zhang, I realized that um, maybe there was something else that could impose even more of the original structure on the on the problem, and um, and that was really the Kiefer and Wolfowitz uh, 1956 nonparametric MLE. Uh, for mixture models. And um, so I started using that and trying to do comparisons and I was getting very frustrated by the fact that it was very slow. Um, it's a quite striking thing really that um, it took more than 20 years after the Kiefer and Wolfowitz paper for Nan Laird to uh, come along with a uh, EM uh, implementation, which was the first computational implementation of this uh, method. It turns out that Herbert Robbins actually has an a has a abstract in the 1950 annals uh, suggesting that he had a consistency proof um, as Kiefer and Wolfowitz did. Um, but I can't, couldn't find any further evidence of uh, that, uh, of a paper that corresponded to that abstract. Um, I don't know how common that was in the, uh, early 50s, but in any case, um, the basic uh, frustration that I was having with the EM algorithm led to the following observation, which is very simple. So EM uh, proceeds by uh, discretizing this mixing distribution, which I'm calling little f, and uh, so it's supported on a bunch of points uh, u1 through um. And um, so, and then it does this fixed point iteration. And it, it does actually quite sensible things for a little while, and then it just gets very tired of doing something very substantial, and it just sort of makes these very, very small steps. And uh, so um, a, re a solution, a reasonable solution with this fixed point algorithm to a problem with a couple hundred observations and m equal, uh, you know, two or three hundred, um, takes 10 minutes or something. Um, but you can reformulate the thing quite easily um, with the same kind of discretization 
as a um, convex programming problem, and then you can solve by standard interior point methods, and it's uh, quite efficient. So this is really, um, as um, Andre was suggesting uh, yesterday, this is even more off the shelf, I would say, than uh, the kinds of things that he was describing. Um, we just have, you know, strictly convex objective functions subject to some linear equality constraints and, and these, uh, uh, the constraint that f is uh, positive and, and uh, integrates to 1. So um, then the question is, well, what kinds of solutions do you get about, uh, from this? And, and this is a kind of well-studied thing. Even in Nan Laird's paper, there was a um, result saying that you got you got a discrete distribution with less than n uh, mass points. In fact, in uh, typical applications, you get considerably less than n mass points, uh, more like log n mass points, actually, in a lot of cases. But um, the positivity constraint is basically acting a bit like the Breiman um, non-negative garrot in a, in a way. It, it, it's basically selecting a few mass points for you in a kind of automated way. And so there are lots of advantages of this. I mean, one advantage, I mean, one huge advantage from my perspective <laughs> is there are no tuning parameters. Um, so it, and it's a pure maximum likelihood strategy. Um, but it, um, it actually performs very well. Um, you may not like the, the discrete mixing distribution aspect of it, but in fact, it does seem to encode in a reasonable way um, what's necessary about F to produce a reasonable G from the point of view of constructing a Bayes rule. Um, and uh, uh, again, Efron is, has been looking at, at very similar problems in a somewhat more parametric uh, setting. He calls this uh, kind of general technology Bayesian deconvolution. I was looking around for some kind of terminology for this um, because um, clearly in the Gaussian sequence case, you're, you are doing deconvolution, but um, in these other mixture settings like Weibull or, or any number of other things, there are, um, um, the, the situation is really a little bit different. Um, the, but there's, I think, I mean, I guess it's important to say that, um, you know, the maximum likelihood version of this is, is not at all uh, the end of the story. One obviously um, could um, introduce additional prior information or penalties in order to, uh, um, adapt this to um, various more specialized settings. But even the uh, maximum likelihood uh, setup seems to be actually quite interesting and provide a quite uh, general um, uh, tool for, for, or building block for, for a number of other problems, including multiple testing. Um, and I, I guess the, the final comment is just that we don't really know anything about Kiefer and Wolfowitz, um, or at least I don't know anything much about the statistical uh, uh, behavior of, the, uh, of this F hat, um, or about related uh, matters uh, <clears throat> that are quite important, like profile likelihood. Um, but I was very happy to see in the um, uh, preliminary announcement of uh, John Wellner's Lacombe lecture that he was planning on saying something about both of these things uh, at the bottom of the uh, slide. Um, so that's just about it. Um, I'm kind of a computational statistics guy, so I thought I would endorse uh, Rudy Buran's somewhat uh, provocative comment about or definition of statistics as the study of algorithms for uh, data analysis. Um, I also uh, quite like this uh, Cox comment that was made after a uh, RSS discussion of a paper by Savage in which there had been quite a lot of back and forth about Bayesian and frequentist this and that. and. Um, he seemed to uh, think that it would have been a little bit more uh, useful to uh, think 
more about uh, new models rather than arguing about how to analyze old models. Um, and finally, I, I guess I'd just like to reiterate that um, there are, I think, a number of regression settings where observable heterogeneity can be looked at with uh, quantile regression uh, tools or estimation of conditional quantile models that um, are, are somewhat uh, useful and that unobserved heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity can li likewise by, be uh, looked at using um, mixture setups of this sort. I, I think that you know, clearly this is really in the spirit of hierarchical models and um, this is the, the Kiefer and Wolfowitz uh, strategy is, is really just a way to think about making some of those models a little bit more flexible from the point of view of maybe exploratory data analysis. I think with that I can stop. Thank you very much for this talk. I think there's some time for questions. Okay, well then let's thank the speaker again.